thousands of people across the country who've never demonstrated before, from all political backgrounds and non, are all interested in coming out because they care passionately about wildlife. Badgers have lived in the UK for over 300,000 years. Many of their sets are over 500 years old and they have protection. This is a good example of how industrialization of livestock production to give us cheap meat to milk has had a negative impact on wildlife. The badgers got the disease from cattle, from the industrialization of cattle, from moving cattle around with very poor security on the farm. And the cattle have infected the badgers over a period of years and now the wildlife is being destroyed as a consequence. I think it's a very divisive issue it's divided communities in the countryside, between the farming community, many of whom feel that this is justified, they have to take action to kill badgers in this way, and the broader rural community and people in towns and cities across the country who feel actually there's no justification at all. So I think it's causing real division within rural society, which I think is dangerous, not just in the pilot coal zones, but where we might go nationally if we move this policy forward. Their argument is that you have a TB problem in cattle, that the primary source of that TB problem comes from badgers, and by killing badgers you reduce the transmission of that disease. Most scientists who are experts in this field, based upon in-depth scientific studies the last Labour government did, which spent £50 million on this and killed 11,000 badgers, found that by actually culling badgers in this way, we could well make the spread of that disease worse. And it's not just animal welfare concerns. On a scientific basis, this could be a catastrophic step in the wrong direction. The number of things have to happen. Firstly, we move 13 million animals a year in this country in terms of the cattle trade. That's bigger than anywhere else in Europe. Our biosecurity measures, controls in terms of testing of those animals, controls in the farm area in terms of gates and fences to prevent interaction between badgers and cattle is very poor. So we have to get on top of biosecurity, both at the farm gate level and with regards to the controls and testing mechanisms of those cattle. We've started to do that. In January, the European Commission applied new rules, which farmers and the UK government have to put in place. And since January to May, we've actually seen nearly a 3% reduction in TB in the herds, which is a sign it's working. I try my best, but I don't think, I'm pretty sure, we're, we've come up this path mm. here. The Wounded Badger Patrols was something that was created from the Team Badger campaign movement, looking for ways we could bring people together to peacefully protest against this cull within the law and could do something to try and help retrieve wounded animals that might come out of the coal zone. So it was a new idea, one that's really caught people's imagination. Hundreds of people have gone down to Gloucestershire and Somerset from the UK, Europe and even places like the United States to participate in these patrols. Caught the imagination of the media, both in the UK and around the world, and I think has really made people think about the level of interest and concern for protecting wildlife across the country. You can see that this is a set here because of all the earth that they've scratched down whilst they're burying themselves, and you can just see just in there the actual set itself. Mm. Well, Wounded Badger Patrol, as the name implies, was set up to try and find injured animals after the shooting but really our roles expanded and we're now patrolling around the countryside and seeing if we can see any suspicious activity and if we come across shooters we're hoping to stop it before the badgers are injured by legal means, just by our presence being there frightening off the badgers. The other important thing is to raise a profile of what's going on in the country and get more people involved. It's totally unscientific, it's really badly thought out. As soon as you fire a shot, so a badger's gonna scurry back to its hole, so you're only gonna get one at each attempt. You're not gonna wipe out a set. And they've got a target of 70% of badgers. Well, they're not reaching that, partly because of the work of Wounded Badger Patrol and other groups. And now they're having to resort to other means like cage trapping, which is very cruel and it's not what the trial was set out to do, that was to test the humaneness of free shooting and that was tested by how long it takes a badger to scream before it dies, so that's how unpleasant all this is. Can I just ask you where these goggles came from? Uh, yeah, Brian Mays lent them to us. Why does he need military night vision goggles? <laughs> <laughs> He doesn't. He bought them for us, I think. <laughs> All good. I've been quite shocked, actually, at um, how much animosity there is towards us. We're an entirely peaceful group, and polls have said that 80% of the population are against the badger cull, 
and yet in these rural villages it's quite uncomfortable to walk through them. It's caused a lot of rifts. What kind of information is anyone getting about what's going on? Well, that's the strange and rather sinister thing. There's been very little revealed on how the shooters are doing, what sort of numbers there are. They were supposed to release numbers recently and they dodged the question completely. So it makes you wonder what's going on. You know, they're obviously ashamed of what they're doing. Have you had any problems with the authorities, landowners, anything like that? Well, yes, I'm guarding a set several nights a week and we've had no end of trouble with um, the landowner making rather absurd complaints about things like we're not keeping to the footpath, our torches are too bright and they're disturbing residents. We even had a great debacle with the police as to whether two old ladies could sit down on some fold-up chairs for a while or did we have to keep moving along the footpath, whether it would constitute loitering if we sat down for a while. So this is a sort of level of things we're constantly subject to and it just gets very tiresome and it's rather pathetic really. Let's be clear, a lot of people in communities where these badgers are being killed have long-term relationships with these animals. Maybe have fed them, maybe have gone out with various uh, badger groups over the years to monitor sets to stop illegal killing of these animals. They feel a very strong connection with them. And many have literally sat on top of these sets to protect and monitor these animals to stop them being killed. They have a very strong emotional attachment and a strong moral position and view about the need to try and protect them. When I was about six, I can remember going on marches with my dad, like to get the protection order on them in the first place, because I've always been into badgers ever since I was a kid, so this is like just carrying it on now. Well, the sets are all along here. You can see where they're digging out fresh holes as well. So um, the stream, they, they use this because there's a stream down the bottom there where they get their fresh water from. And also there's lots of berries and stuff like that that they can get from just down there. So they like to use this. I've been coming for about two months, but we were looking for pre-baiting and cages obviously here. So I would say about 70 days. I do in the day and night time. I normally check for pre-baiting and cages in the daytime. So I'd say I get here about three and I stay here till about four, half four. And then I go and come back at dusk when the shooters normally start to shoot. And I'm here from dusk till dawn normally. I guard them now, <laughs> they become my babies. So, especially when you see them as well, because they're only youngsters here, so. And also they use a cornfield. There's a cornfield over the back, so they use that as well. You can see the little latrines in there. <laughs> so yeah, they, it's uh, yeah, it's been hard going, but it's been worth it. And I'll be here for another three weeks by the looks of it. So guarding these babies. I was walking along the footpath, and a badger poked his head out <laughs> just as I was walking along. So it was quite funny. I sort of put my torch there, and I saw his head. He sat there for about two minutes, and then sort of darted off. But yeah, they're really sweet here. I am going to be setting up my own badger group for the coal zone. I have about 70 people already interested. My friends are going to help me set it up as well. We'll be coming out, taking pictures of all the sets, monitoring them once a week. Also, we found sets that we didn't even know were here. So they have to be checked as well and protected. Basically, we're going to just let the farmers know that we're not going away after the coal. In this particular area, Eldersfield, there's about six, seven sets in this area we're trying to protect. Across the zone, oh, I think between 50 and 100. Well, what have you been doing in the run up to this? We've been surveying the area, going around all the fields, hedgerows, and woodlands looking for sets, reporting sets that have been trashed, there's been a lot of that. Doing research into who owns which land, who's in the coal, who's out of the coal. Just getting to know the area much better and then checking for traps, checking for bait points before the coal started and then protecting sets. 
The Hunt Saboteur movement's legal movement has been around since the 1960s. Initially, actually, it started in the war years when American flyers who opposed hunting around the air bases in East Anglia and other places used to go out and try and save foxes. Interesting history behind it. And that movement has played a key role in this, as it has in looking at the illegal hunting of foxes and other animals too. What they're doing is basically monitoring, uh, going into the areas where this is taking place, and doing what the government effectively is not doing. And that's putting in place effective safeguards for humaneness monitoring, because we don't have them. At the moment we have about six inspectors to cover both areas of Gloucestershire and Somerset, two at any one time on the ground, completely ineffective. At the moment, obviously, they're out free shooting badges and cage trapping. So there are people who will walk across footpaths or do what is necessary to save those badges by making them go to ground or disrupting the bait points and where the cages are. If they smell us or they smell other stuff or hear us or see us, they'll hopefully go to ground and be safe. We don't even know why we're doing this. It might be nothing. Either way. The police, as I say, we sub this area at least twice a week and when we've been attacked or the car's been attacked and they're illegally hunting or trashing badger sets, the police response has been mediocre but we find that we're followed about. We've followed for five hours the other night when we weren't doing anything, followed for five hours. Morning. Hello. Hello. Can I just ask where you're following us today? Because that's what we've been asked to do. Okay, do you have any idea why you've been asked to do that? Um, I presume it's so that we can uh, prevent any offences being committed. And do you have suspicion that offences may be committed? I would imagine that whoever's asked us to follow you has those suspicions. Yeah. Okay. Uh, can I ask who's uh, actually asked you to follow us? Who's in charge of what you're doing? I don't know. They're just referred to by their by the control room. That's all. Okay. Um, I don't know who individually. Would Okay. Um, can I ask who's usually your superior officer? I'm not a local officer, so... Okay. Where are you from? I am based at uh, Rubri Police Station. Okay. Which uh, force is that? Yeah. Okay. And can I have your badge number, please? You can. It's 578. Okay. Fantastic. Can I have your lovely colleague's badge number, please? My call number is 386. 386. Are you from West Mercia as well? West Mercia, please. Okay, fantastic. All right, thank you. You're very welcome. Have a good night. Yeah, and you. Good morning to you. People have been asked for their details repeatedly and repeatedly harassed. So why are you asking people for their details? Well, uh, because um, we've, we're here because of the cow yeah. okay? And uh, we want to make sure that lawful activity here? actually takes place. Yep. Um, if anyone's here with unhonourable intentions, mm -hmm. then we need to make sure that uh, they're not carrying out those intentions. Is your friend intentions. from Warwickshire as well? well. Okay. No, so right. do you have any evidence that there might actually be unlawful activity well, going on? Well, I can't, or are I, you literally just harassing I, people I who are meeting in no, a church Nobody's car harassing no. anybody. We can speak to people if we need to. If they want to speak to us and they're not carrying out any unlawful activity, they, they don't have to give us the details. Right. Excuse me, which okay. police force are you from? Uh, why do you need to know that? Well, because I've got your number because you're a police officer in uniform and I'd like to have you... I've got your number, but I need yep. to know which police force because there's three different police forces okay. at least here tonight and I'd like to know which one. Are you willing to give me your details? No, I'm Does not. I've spoken to you? You're an officer in uniform. Okay. All I right. don't have to give you my details. Well, no, no you don't have to I, give and me I don't, your details. I, I've got I, your number. Okay, you've got when, my number. When we go fine. to professional standards, it gets yeah. complicated as to which police officer belongs to which force. I'd like to know which force you're from, please. Okay, I'm from West Mercy Police. Thank you. I've got nothing to hide, so... All right. They've been acting as agents of the NFU, as other NFU employees, been trying to serve people with pieces of legal paper from the National Farmers Union, which demonstrates extreme bias. They've been swamping the area with police officers from Warwickshire, West Mercia and Gloucestershire. And I understand further afield, Avon and Somerset and Devon police have been here as well. So five different police forces in this area, which is pretty unprecedented. All of a sudden, they can afford lots and lots of police officers and lots of resources. Whereas when it comes to wildlife crime, there's nothing there. There's no resources whatsoever. Are you actually allowed to do this search on private property? So it's not private property. It's church property. Let's not, you know, you don't play games with me. I know it's church property. You know it's church property. It's a church car park.
which the public have implied permission to use, but it's the same as a shopping centre. You have implied permission to go into the shopping centre as a member of public. You have implied permission to go into Sainsbury's as a member of public. That permission can be denied and it's still counted as private property. Do you want to talk to your superior officer? I spoke to him, sir. OK. Would you, would you, is he about? Would you be able to get him down? to the circumstances in which a vehicle being found this evening, yeah? Yeah. Um, we have got the grounds, as we mentioned, in Section 1 of the Police and Criminal Evidence Act to search this vehicle. All right. All right. Now, we obviously want your cooperation to do that. Mm. Yeah. If you refuse mm. to let us search, okay, we can use reasonable force. Yeah. We don't want to do mm. that, but we're asking for your cooperation. Okay. Right. Mm. So are you going to let us search the vehicle? There's, there's one issue mm. before we Go do on. that, yeah. This is private property. Can you do that in private mm. property? This isn't private property. <coughs> this is private property. This is a public place. This it's a, it's a church car park. That's right, yeah. It okay. belongs to the church. So why is it private? It belongs to the church. Okay, it does belong to the church, but there's a public access for it. That, that's the public access area. Okay, but irrespective of that, okay, um, the vehicle, your vehicle... Why don't you just wait till I drive on the road? Your vehicle has been just found in circumstances I'm where it is in the least interference yeah. with motor vehicle. Okay. We're going to keep going over old ground. Yeah. But, uh, Let me we've explained you know, to what the... It, it isn't harassment. It is ex who's other vehicle are you searching tonight? Are you searching those that go shooting badges? Are you sure it's shooting the marksmen? No, you're not. You're, you're searching our vehicle because it's harassment. No, we're searching your vehicle because it's been found or seen in suspicious circumstances. Allegedly. Last night we got a call to Course Hill and I understand that activists were on a public footpath. They were then attacked by four men. The car had its wing mirrors broken off. One of the men who I identified as Mr Roger Warner, who's one of the masters of the Lebri hunt and also a beef farmer at Town Street Farm in Turley. He is alleged to have said that, uh, oh, we won't be able to drive off, it's unroadworthy. <laughs> They pointed out the fact that both the mirrors were gone from the vehicle, so therefore the vehicle's not roadworthy and can't drive anywhere. But both the wing mirrors were on the vehicle when we went up the public footpath, which is just over there, marked yeah. as a public footpath, just to your right, which is where they saw us coming down from. They're claiming that we were trespassing, but we weren't. It's a public footpath, and they commit criminal damage on one of our vehicles. Oh, yeah. Any idea how their mirrors got damaged at all? Absolutely no idea. No we, idea at no, all? No idea at all. Okay, Could so... Just turn that off. So, I mean, how come um, you lot pointed out their mirrors were damaged to them when... Uh, I mean, how, I mean, how did you know that their mirrors were damaged on both sides? Don't even speak. Don't even speak to them. One young lad was punched in the face by another man who had a beard and was slightly plump and uh, he's now been arrested for that assault. So, generally speaking, we are quite used to this sort of behaviour. Our wing mirrors are often ripped off, cars often scratched. We've had cameras stolen from us with this particular pack. And so we're quite used to this sort of behaviour, but on previous occasions, of course, the police have done nothing. I do think there was something to do with the coal. They had a gun in the back of their boot. So I was, on, I was to the left. This cull was not about science. We know they're not testing the animals for TB. It wasn't really about humaneness. That was sort of added on at the last minute because of campaigners like me and others who brought it to people's attention. Really what it's about is a killing effectiveness study. You go into two big areas the size of the Isle of Wight, you give the people six weeks and a license to shoot badgers, and what they're trying to see is if can you kill them by bringing them up out of the set and shooting them, this free shooting exercise, to a number in a time period that will make it efficient for you to then roll that out across the country. So that 5,300 target is very important. We believe they are very, very well short of that. 
I think what the public wants to know is how you put a value on animals like badgers. This government has done a terrible job of listening to the wildlife conservation movement. What it's generally done is aligned itself with the hunting, the landowning and farming industries and basically given them the opportunity to dictate the policy. And what we're seeing is a huge reaction from people across the country in organisations like the Wildlife Trust that has 800,000 plus members or the RSPB that has 3 million members that dwarf the Conservative Party, for example, with 130,000. And what you're seeing is those people are now beginning to get together on social media and campaign groups and become a very strong political voice. Labour Party understand that. They came out clearly against the Badger Cull because they realise there's lots of votes in this issue. And I think the Conservatives need to wake up to reality as well. This is a strong voice for the future. We need a balance in the debate about protecting wildlife. And these individuals across the country coming together in their millions will make sure that strong voice exists for the future well beyond the Badger Cull debate. They need to be protected, so that's what I'm going to be doing, hopefully, for the rest of my life. So, because I care. I care what happens to them.